Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the Black Maternal Health Virtual Symposium with a focus on the Southeast region as presented by staff of the Black Mamas Matter Alliance for our fifth annual Black Maternal Health Week campaign. My name is Milan Spencer, and I am the Manager of Workforce Development and Partnerships here at BMMA. Before we get started, I would like to cover some logistical items. Everyone is currently muted and will stay muted during the webinar. We will have time at the end for questions via the chat box, so please feel free to submit any questions that arise throughout the webinar, and we will try to do our best to address them after the presentation. Please also note that today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website by the end of the week. Next slide. We have a jam packed agenda for you. In addition to learning about the purpose of BMMA's work, we will feature content from BMMA's most recent publications and resources highlighting our research and policy work both nationally and at the state level. Next slide. I wanna take a moment to express our deep gratitude to all of this year's Black Maternal Health Week sponsors. Next slide. We'd like to give a special recognition to our change maker level sponsors, Pampers, Vitamin Angels, Walgreens, and the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation. Your investment in this campaign continues to help us make a significant impact in the collective fight to end maternal mortality. Next slide. Good afternoon, now, um, good afternoon Milan. If we can go back two more slides. Sure. Founded by the Black Mamas Matter Alliance, the National Black Maternal Health Week campaign intentionally takes place in April, which is recognized in the US as National Minority Health Month. We begin Black Maternal Health Week on April 11th annually to join dozens of global organizations in marking this day as International Day for Maternal Health and Rights, an opportunity to advocate for the elimination of maternal mortality globally. The purpose of Black Maternal Health Week is to deepen the national conversation about Black maternal health so that public stakeholders understand how root causes like structural racism and gender oppression act as drivers of Black maternal health disparities. The 2022 theme, Building for Liberation, Centering Black Mamas, Black Families, and Black Systems of Care, reflects BMMA's work in centering Black women's scholarship, maternity care work, and advocacy across the full spectrum of sexual, maternal, and reproductive health care services, programs, and initiatives. Additionally, the theme reflects the critical need for learning about Black feminist and womanist approaches and strengthening wellness structures within our communities across the diaspora as a revolutionary act in the pursuit of liberation and in the global fight to end maternal mortality. I'll now turn it back over to Milan. Thank you for that, Angela. Can we go up a couple of slides? Thank you. Now I'd like to take the time to introduce our panelists. We have a wonderful team here at BMMA and these are the folks you will be hearing from today. First up, we have Clark Willer. She's the Federal Policy Manager at Black Mamas Matter Alliance. Prior to, join, to joining BMMA, she worked in government relations at Planned Parenthood of New York City and on economic justice issues in New York City government. She holds a master's in public affairs from Princeton University and a BA in Africana studies and political science from Bernard College. We then have Dr. Ayana Robinson in the research and evaluation department. She's the director of research and evaluation for Black Mamas Matter Alliance and also the founder of Black Girls Breastfeeding Club and the Birth Work app. She has over a decade of research and evaluation experience, primarily supporting initiatives at the federal level. She received her PhD in health promotion and behavior from the University of Georgia and a certificate in inter interdisciplinary qualitative research studies. We also have Sang Hee Wan, who is a research project manager with Black Mamas Matter Alliance. 
where she oversees efforts to strengthen the capacity of maternal mortality review committees to better integrate strategies toward equitable practices. Sangi also works as a maternal health consultant, focusing on projects that seek to ensure respectful maternity care for birthing people of color and reducing disparities in maternal health outcomes. Next, we have Felicia Castillo Sanders, who is a senior data manager in the research and evaluation department at the Black Mamas Matter Alliance. In this role, she spearheads the collection, management, and analysis of data and uses quantitative and qualitative methods to build, support, and implement Black maternal, sexual, and reproductive health research ventures. And finally, I would like to turn it over back to Angela Doyensola Aina, co-founder and executive director of Black Mamas Matter Alliance, who will be moderating our symposia today. Thank you so much, Milan. Next slide. Next slide. So a bit about us. The Black Mamas Matter Alliance is a national network of Black women-led organizations and multidisciplinary professionals that work across the full spectrum of maternal and reproductive health. We operate at the national, state, and local levels and collaborate to advance policy, promote holistic maternity care, cultivate research, and uplift culture to advance Black maternal health, all rooted in birth and reproductive justice, respectful maternity care, and the human rights frameworks. Next slide. Of particular note, we use the phrase Black Mamas to include a range of folks, from women and birthing people across the African diaspora to those who care for and mother our families and our communities, whether they have given birth or not. We stand in solidarity with all Black Mamas. Next slide. At BMMA, we approach our work through the goals of working to change policy by utilizing the human rights framework to address health inequities and improve Black maternal health outcomes, cultivate research that leverages community knowledge and Black scholarship, advance care by promoting holistic, respectful, and comprehensive maternal and reproductive health approaches to Black mama's care, and shifting culture to dismantle negative narratives on Black motherhood and amplify the voices and experiences of Black mamas. Next slide. So we are facing a maternal health crisis in the US. While we've seen the maternal mortality ratio decline in many countries around the world in the last 30 years, during this same time period, the United States maternal mortality ratio rose significantly. Even more disturbing, the maternal mortality ratio for Black women is three to five times greater than that of white women despite our annual expenditures of 111 billion annually on maternal and newborn care, which indicates that we need to do things differently as it relates to public health and medicine. However, the most important thing to note is that these deaths are preventable. Next slide. And so when presented with the health disparities in maternal mortality and the appalling statistics of Black maternal health in the U.S., we should dig into the root cause of these issues. The regulation of Black women's reproductive decisions have been a central aspect of racial oppression in America. Enslaved pregnant Black women were forced to work in plantation fields up until their labor, rarely given a chance to rest and bond with their babies and were required to go back to the fields with their babies strapped on their backs. The institution of slavery in the US opened the door for all types of unjust medical experimentation on black women's bodies. Everything from experimental vaginal surgeries without anesthesia on enslaved black women to stealing cervical cancer cells, all in the name of advancing science. Of note though, is that black women have always organized, mobilized, and provided care to our communities through many social justice movements for many decades, which has informed and shaped medicine, nursing, public health practice, and the maternal and child health systems of the United States of America. Next slide. We must remember that these preventable maternal death data are real people. 
This is why it is part of our core values to always say the names of those we've lost to maternal mortality and show the faces of Black women that were victims to systemic racist medical practices that contribute, contributed to their demise. Erica Garner, Dr. Shalon Irving, Kara Dixon Johnson, Christelle Galloway, Amber Rose Isaac, Lashonda Hazard, Shaasia Washington, Yolanda Kadima, and many others whom were Black women from different economic and educational backgrounds who all died because they were neglected, disrespected, and denied timely quality care before, during, and after pregnancy. Next slide. In public health, we are used to operating our programs, establishing evidence-based practices and health policy through the use of indicators and performance measures. However, when we are talking about racial disparities, relying solely on indicators and performance methods often causes us to leave out a missing part of the experience of being a Black woman in this country. And this is why framing is so important to Black maternal health. The devaluation of Black womenhood and Black motherhood in the United States places Black women seeking pregnancy-related health care at unique risk for abuse and neglect in facility-based birth settings. Because entrenched discrimination on the basis of gender, race, class, and other factors is both normalized and denied in the US, many instances of mistreatment and violence in birth facilities are overlooked or accepted by government actors, healthcare professionals, and even patients themselves. This is why BMMA intentionally frames our work within the birth and reproductive justice frameworks. And we will hear from our presenters today examples of how we do just that. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Ayana Robinson. Thank you, Angela. Next slide, please. As Angela mentioned, Black women are three to five times more likely to have a maternal death than white women in the United States. Maternal mortalities in the US continue to rise from 2018 to 2020. In 2020, Black women were most disproportionately affected by maternal death with a, mater with a mortality rate of 55.3 deaths per 100,000 live births, a significant increase from 2019 to 2020. Negative experiences and outcomes have further been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic with additional complications due to COVID-19 and disruptions in maternity care. Next slide. Recognizing that addressing the maternal mortality and morbidity crisis necessitates strategies grounded in Black women's lived experiences, wisdom, and leadership, Black Mamas Matter Alliance Research Working Group sought to develop research principles for conducting research on maternal outcomes with, for, and by Black Mamas. The full report describing the methodology and the research principles will be released soon. However, the research principles have been published else, elsewhere, specifically in the Harvard Law and Policy Review in 2020. Next slide. The following frameworks have been integral to the Alliance and inform all of BMMA's work. Birth justice, reproductive justice, human rights, black feminism, womanism, and research justice. The frameworks incorporate activist perspectives into research and recognize Black women as experts that produce knowledge and information that will institute changes in their lives and also communities. BMMA's research working group developed the depicted holistic care research principles based not only on the findings from an exploratory review, but also the expertise and experiences of the authors and contributors for this document who have worked in maternal health and conducted research with and for Black mamas over the last 30 years. Next slide, please. This slide includes a quote from one of BMMA's collaborators and contributors to the research principles and really just expresses shared sentiments across the contributors. Next 
Next slide. As I mentioned, we developed six research principles to guide research conducting with four and by Black mamas. The first principle is recognize and respect the rights of Black mamas. Respecting the rights of Black mamas includes acknowledging that Black mamas have a unique expertise, skills, and perspectives that should be centered in all research questions, methods, and analyses of data specific to Black people. Central to this principle is recognizing the human right to health and safety for Black mamas and their families. The second principle is understand the historical, sociocultural, political, and economic context in which Black mamas live their lives. Black mamas' lived experiences should not be assumed to mirror their white counterparts. Intersecting oppressions that cause trauma and impact Black mamas' health care are crucial to developing research that ma matches the needs of Black mamas. It requires challenging the default model of whiteness and medicine, listening to the voices of Black mamas, and addressing the use of biased language to refer to Black mamas as well. Next slide. The third principle is invest in Black women as researchers. Institutions should invest in, hire, consult with, and adequately compensate Black women scholars at all levels of research. Black women scholars bring a unique perspective and experiences that can enhance the understanding of determinants of health that impact Black women, along with the use of Black women's theoretical frameworks, for example, Black feminism, womanism, and reproductive justice, to inform the development and promotion of community-centered research. The fourth principle is fund and conduct ethical research that benefits Black mamas. This includes ensuring that research dollars are equitably spent on studies that truly benefit Black mama populations. Elevating mixed methods and emancipatory methodologies, for example, that capture data with cultural rigor and shifting research questions from deficit, deficit focus to identifying assets and also resilience. The fifth principle is honor and commit to community engagement through the entire research process. Respect for Black mamas as experts due to their lived experiences and involve Black mamas in the research process. Use community-based participatory practices and additional emancipatory research models when conducting research with Black mamas. Also include community-based organizations that are led by Black mamas in their communities in the process of analyzing and disseminating data. Finally, allocate funding and resources towards the development of health equity impact assessment tools to evaluate the intended and also the unintended consequences of resources developed by, for, and with Black mamas. Centering Black women in research, both as creators of new knowledge and as those who stand to benefit from findings, has tremendous potential to improve maternal health for Black mamas and other pregnant and parenting individuals. These principles serve as an ethical standard for research and practice, which researchers should utilize when engaging Black mama populations in the development of programs, interventions, and also research design. And I will turn Thank it you. over to Sankey Wan. Thank you so much, Ayanna. So BMMA has been applying these research principles to our work both nationally and in Georgia where BMMA is based. Foremost, we have worked to prioritize research with, for, and by Black mamas. One of the first opportunities to apply these research principles occurred in 2018 through a partnership with Columbia University's Averting Maternal Death and Disability Program, or AMDD. AMDD is a global program that conducts research and policy analysis and provides technical support to advance maternal health and well being. Since 2010, they have been working globally to measure and build awareness of the mistreatment of women during childbirth. In 2018, AMDD received funding from Merck for Mothers to advance respectful maternity care in the United States 
by conducting a mixed methods research project aimed at exploring the interpersonal non-clinical aspects of care that women experience during pregnancy and childbirth in New York City and Atlanta. Next slide. Next slide, please. While the New York City portion of the study was bigger in scope, the Atlanta-based portion of the study focused on understanding Black women's and birth workers' experiences of the disrespect and abuse they experienced during pregnancy and childbirth. Next slide. The overall goal of the project was exploratory and formative. We sought to generate insights about and understand the role of disrespect and abuse in maternity care in Atlanta. The study was informed by the principles of community-based participatory research, which is a core BMMA research principle. Thus, BMMA was committed to sharing both the decision-making power and ownership of the project with community members and researchers, and to use the research to inform actionable steps to create meaningful change in affected communities. To that end, BMMA engaged Atlanta-based partners as an advisory board from the start. We hosted a kickoff meeting with local community-based organizations, maternal health advocates, birth support workers, and members of the founding BMMA steering committee to help us think through the merits, process, and steps of the entire research project. Ultimately, two other project partners, the Center for Black Women's Wellness and Atlanta Healthy Start Initiative, joined BMMA and AMDD in conducting the research. And together, we collaborated on the recruitment, tool development and adaptation, data collection and analysis and dissemination in Atlanta. Next slide. We conducted seven total focus group discussions, five focus group discussions with 30 black women and two focus group discussions with six birth support workers were conducted in April, 2018. The focus group discussions explored women's experiences of pregnancy and childbirth in a hospital setting, including their expectations, desires, and perceptions of treatment during pregnancy and childbirth as well as birth support workers' experiences supporting women, their impressions of the health system, and their perceptions of women's treatment during pregnancy and childbirth by hospital-based staff. Women were eligible to participate if they self-identified as Black, had given birth in the last three years, were over 18 years old, and lived in the Atlanta area. Birth workers were eligible if they assisted Black women during pregnancy and childbirth as a doula or family support worker. Recruitment was done by all partners via flyer distribution through mailing lists, social media platforms, and community group meetings. Next slide, please. Overall, we found that women and birth workers in Atlanta experienced disrespect and mistreatment during pregnancy and childbirth that aligned with what has been found and documented globally. Specifically, the women and birth workers in our study reported experiencing harsh language, ineffective communication, lack of consent and confidentiality, dismissal of concerns and pain, and racism and discrimination. Next slide. Here we, we present what women reported experiencing, which aligned with what birth support workers reported witnessing on their jobs. The women in our study spoke at length about their experiences with providers who used harsh language and ineffective communication as a means to blame and belittle them. Harsh language consisted of women experiencing rude and condescending language, feeling dismissed and disrespected by healthcare providers, having their babies or their own health outcome threatened, and poor bedside manners and professionalism by providers. Birth support workers reported witnessing rude and condescending language, as well as judgment and blame towards women by providers. Women also reported experiencing ineffective communication, whereby they were not spoken to in a way they understood, were not told what was happening or did happen to them, did not receive enough information or felt like they were being taken advantage of or purposely ignored by providers. Birth support workers confirmed that women were not told what was happening to them and that women were left to feel taken advantage of and purposely ignored. Next slide. As one woman stated, 
not only was the childbirth experience processy, it was processy without explanation. I don't even want to say secretive, it was damn near secretive where they didn't want to explain what was going on or how. Similarly, a birth support worker said, I think it's very disrespectful to always assume that a person or a patient knows what's happening or what to expect. We're talking about just the language that's being used. You know, like, you don't have to holler like that, or you should know by now. You have had five babies. You should have thought about that before you got pregnant again. Next slide. Lack of informed consent and confidentiality and dismissal of pain were frequently reported by women in our study. Women maintained that there was lack of information to fully consent to policies and procedures, that they were manipulated into consenting, especially in the use of residents and interns, and that providers and staff violated their privacy during labor and childbirth. Moreover, both women and birth support workers reported how there was utter disregard for their concerns and pain during labor and childbirth. This practice of viewing Black patients as more pain tolerant and less deserving ties directly to a history of subjugation and abuse by the medical system that continues to devalue Black women. Next slide. One woman shared that when I tour, they just took the baby out of the room and they were coming in and out of the room with the door wide open. And I was, if y'all don't close the door, y'all got my legs wide open and this is just not the move. You can't do this. Another woman spoke about how she didn't know how she could get pain medication by saying, they didn't give me any pain medication for getting my stitches or anything. So I was in there screaming while they were stitching me up. And I didn't know until recently that you were supposed to have pain medicine while they're getting, while you're getting stitches because I didn't care with any of my other children. Next slide. Lastly, women in our study reported experiencing racism and discrimination. They reported that providers made racist assumptions about them and that they faced discrimination due to a host of factors, including insurance coverage, socioeconomic status, age and marital status, the latter of which birth support workers also reported witnessing. Next slide. One woman said, I felt like the provider just lumped, oh, you're black, you're overweight, you eat fried chicken every day and don't care if you're, take care of yourself. I think she just assumed that. That was probably her perception, but it just came across as disrespect. One birth support worker spoke about how providers made so many assumptions a black, about black pregnant women saying, when you're black, already there's so much inherent medical racism. There's so much in the way that we're trained. There's so many assumptions that are made on what got you pregnant. How many other kids do you have? How many abortions have you had? Who is this person with you? Is that the father? Who is that over there? Next slide. Our study found that the impact of mistreatment on Black women was profound and detrimental. It created mistrust between pregnant people and their providers, reinforced past negative encounters with the healthcare system, increased women's desires to minimize interactions with facility-based healthcare services, and affected women's perceptions of the quality of care they received. Overall, these experiences not only made women feel deeply disrespected, but it also shaped how they perceived their birthing experiences through a lens of mistreatment, regardless of the provider's motivations and intentions. Given that Black women are nearly three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than white women, these data are particularly disheartening, and there needs to be concerted efforts to acknowledge and eliminate the role of racism as the risk factor to poor maternal health outcomes. One key strategy to recognizing the role of racism in maternal health outcomes is to conduct comprehensive reviews of maternal deaths and complications during pregnancy and childbirth through a multidisciplinary review committee, which Felicia will speak more to next. Next slide. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be discussing some of BMMA's research on maternal mortality review committees and their engagement with community stakeholders. Next slide, please. So let's begin with discussing what is a maternal mortality review committee, which I'll be abbreviating as an MMRC throughout the rest of the presentation. MMRCs are multidisciplinary committees that serve as one mechanism to investigate, acknowledge, and prevent pregnancy-related deaths. 
committees provide comprehensive reviews of deaths that occur within a year after pregnancy. And there are some states and cities that review pregnancy-related deaths as well as pregnancy-related and pregnancy-associated deaths. Critical pieces of the MF MMRC process are to assess contributing factors to the death, to determine preventability of the death, and to examine the root causes. There are 48 states and two cities that have active MMRCs, and 31 states and cities receive funding from the CDC for their MMRCs. Next slide, please. So next, let's discuss why we have MMRCs. Essentially, as discussed earlier, pregnant people are dying. Also, there are racial and ethnic disparities in these deaths, with Black pregnant and birthing people being the most affected. In addition, MMRC data has shown that 60% of these deaths are preventable. Previous mechanisms before MMRCs were created um, to assess maternal deaths have lacked sufficient data on maternal deaths, and this is due to data not being collected in a systematic way, um, and the processes are different for each state. MMRCs are working to standardize that process. In addition, previously, there has been an underreporting of pregnancy-related deaths, coupled with a lack of data on the circumstances related to those deaths. MMRCs work to learn more about the circumstances of each maternal death and to combat this underreporting and to better categorize the reasons for the maternal deaths. However, as MMRCs attempt to conduct comprehensive reviews um, to prevent these deaths and to operationalize their work, there are challenges in the process. There is still a lack of standardization in the process. Tracking and counting maternal deaths at the national and the state level is varied. Also, gaining access to consistent data from state, social, and health systems can be a barrier. Funding is also another challenge, um, which when it's not consistent in some states, states do struggle to sustain their review committees. And there is also a reliance in some states on state legislation and infrastructure. And in, so, in those states, legislation dictates the composition of the committee, including how many seats can be reserved for community members. And that ultimately impacts the voices that are able to come to the table and provide expert views on the reasons contributing to maternal deaths. Internal to the committee, during deliberations, there's still a focus on deficit frameworks and mother blame narratives. MMRCs have traditionally been staffed with medical experts in maternity care. Thus, recommendations traditionally have been focused on clinical care, placing the burden to receive adequate maternal health care on the mother and have not included an analysis of the impact of social determinants of health, reproductive justice, birth justice, and the human rights framework, and how these elements affect both access to and experiences with providers in the maternal health care system. Um, adding more diverse membership to MMRCs from the community would allow for these additional viewpoints. However, MMRCs still struggle to identify, engage, and meaningfully include diverse community members who can speak to the essential context, including the strengths and needs of the communities they represent. Ultimately, recommendations from MMRCs on ways to improve maternal mortality in each state and city are greatly shaped by the data they're able to collect and the circumstances of maternal, around the circumstances of maternal deaths and the individuals who are on the committee discussing these circumstances. Next slide, please. At BMMA, we consistently work to bring together Alliance members to share expertise and engage in coalition building around topics that are important to the communities the Alliance members serve. Alliance members represent the Black perinatal and maternal health workforce and are key stakeholders serving Black birthing people. When engaging in this process of coalition building, we heard from many Alliance members that there were varying experiences engaging with or attempting to engage with their local MMRC. Alliance members reported experiencing hierarchies in decision-making, a reinforcement of power dynamics, and secondary trauma with no mechanism to address harm. Thus, Alliance members who have worked with MMRCs came together to create the issue brief that's on the screen, which includes a call to action and recommendations for MMRCs to reevaluate and think differently about their processes and goals. 
Also, the issue brief highlights ways MMRCs can improve MMRC recommendation outcomes to eliminate maternal deaths and advance and improve maternal health equity by addressing barriers faced by community members who attempt to engage with these MMRCs. The issue brief can be found on our website in the resources and BMMA products sec section, and we thank the Alliance members who shared their experiences and contributed to this body of work who are listed on the slide. Now, this initial work with Alliance members representing the Black perinatal workforce and other key stakeholders serving Black birthing people positioned BMMA to further explore the relationship between MMRCs and their engagement with community partners in our MMRC report. Next slide. So we have published a report documenting an environmental scan that we conducted with nine state MMRCs. This report can also be found on our website, and this work was supported through a partnership with the CDC and AMCHIP. And the goal of our environmental scan was to strengthen the capacity of public health leaders, including those administering and serving on MMRCs, um, to better integrate strategies toward equitable practices across MMRC processes. Also, our goal was to capture challenges and opportunities as described by community members who have engaged with MMRCs. And we collected data between October 2020 and September 2021. Next slide, please. So our environmental scan process included getting an orientation to MMRC processes with the CDC's maternal mortality prevention team and reviewing great literature on MMRCs, including city and state reports, CDC reports, guides, manuals, policies, and procedures. And then we also held discussions with three separate groups that are captured in this participant graphic. We uh, held group discussions with BMMA's 2021 Kindred Partners and Collaborators who have directly or indirectly engaged with their state and city MMRCs. We also had group discussions with community members or with community representatives who were members of one of the nine state MMRCs. And we had individual conversations with chairs, coordinators, and abstractors who sat on MMRCs in three of the nine target states. Next slide, please. So before we jump into the results of the project, I have a few notes. First, this environmental scan was exploratory and formative. It also is not intended or designed to be an exhaustive analysis of all of the challenges and opportunities that exist for MMRCs. Also, the final report is not a comprehensive guide for how MMRCs can integrate equity into their processes. Rather, it's a step forward towards a process of discovery that all MMRCs should and need to take if they're going to truly integrate equity across their review process. And lastly, MMRCs need to determine in conjunction with the local community what recommendations should be implemented in their state or city. Next slide, please. So now moving on to our findings. Overall, our discussions with the various groups um, yielded um, three overarching themes from this environmental scan, and that is subordinate inclusion, engagement barriers around transparency, data, and legislation, and harmful dynamics in MMRC spaces. Next slide, please. For the first theme of subordinate inclusion, participants describe that while MMRCs express a desire for including community voices and members, this inclusion was often subordinate. Community members expressed that their expertise and positionality was not as valued or trusted compared to other members of the committee. In addition, participants reported that language, knowledge, and community strategies, and even community-based organization names were extracted and leveraged to gain funding without inclusion of and accountability to the community. Participants also reported tokenism occurring on committees where there was a strong focus on recruiting diverse membership, but not on inclusion and equity. MMRCs were said to engage in a checkbox, pro checkbox process leaving one spot for a particular race or ethnicity or a person with a particular experience or occupation, like experiencing a near miss or being a midwife. And frequently one spot on the committee is not enough to influence change and can lead to a detrimental experience when you're the only voice presenting different views from the majority. 
Lastly, the last challenge presented under this theme was participants reported that some MMRCs deliberately exclude community members and organizations that challenge the status quo and who work to hold MMRCs accountable in maternity and maternal health discussions. Um, so a variety of opportunities and strategies were also presented to address this theme of subordinate inclusion. Participants stated that MMRCs can afford to recognize that community members are necessary and should be integral to MMRCs since they can provide unique contributions to improving outcomes and experiences of those most affected by inequities in maternal health. And ways in which this can be done include making space for community to lead. CDC and state MMRCs can directly support impacted communities with funding and resources to implement their own solutions. And in terms of MMRC membership, um, you can afford to prioritize uh, Black, Indigenous, and person of color leadership and representation from members who provide holistic care to birthing people and are rooted in the community, like midwives and doulas. In addition, achieving proportional representation of those most affected by maternal mortality and morbidity, which we saw earlier, is mostly Black and Brown people, you can increase the number of Black and Brown people and um, Black and Brown voices on the committee as well. Next slide, please. For the second theme, participants discuss various barriers they face when attempting to engage with MMRCs. There is a lack of transparency in the recruitment process to join an MMRC. It was reported that knowledge was really only shared with a select few, which were usually colleagues of clinical members on the committee. There is also inconsistent reporting of MMRC data and delays in sharing recommendations, which hindered the ability of the community members to optimally serve their communities. And lastly, we also heard legislative hurdles around the minimal number of seats reserved for community members based on state statutes, and there were impediments to community members receiving compensation for time spent and expenses incurred to attend half day to all day MMRC meetings and sometimes in some states background checks to join the MMRC were implemented, which some likened to a medical review board vetting process. So again, a variety of opportunities and strategies were presented to address this theme of engagement barriers around transparency data and legislation. So participants indicated that in general, MMRCs need to increase transparency, resources, and support for community participation. They recommended that MMRCs implement open calls for applications to provide equal access to membership and increase transparency of the recruitment process. Participants stated that MMRC should prioritize the provision of timely and consistent access to data, and this could be done through a diversified communications plan developed with anti-racism experts that includes press releases, public campaigns, infographics, and direct conversations with community about the findings to ensure multiple groups can utilize and benefit from the findings. And these efforts could also be supported through the provision of additional funding for MMRCs to have increased capacity to review cases and uh, disseminate information in a timely manner. Participants also express that community needs to be intimately involved with the creation of recommendations. One participant aptly described the effect of this process indicating, and I quote, when community members' voices weren't truly heard, the recommendations still tended to come back to the status quo. Overall, participants identified the need for a collaborative discussion between communities and MMRCs about their respective roles in developing, implementing, and being held responsible for the implementation of the recommendations. And lastly, participants advocated for MMRCs to work with their local legislative bodies to secure compensation for community members. And this is particularly essential for community members who are often not compensated by their jobs for serving on the committee, like some of their local Department of Public Health and clinical counterparts who work with larger organizations and health systems. And compensation can be an important strategy to increase equity and bolster community engagement. Next slide, please. Moving to our last and final theme on harmful dynamics in MMRC spaces. So participants described that the culture of MMRCs was unwelcoming and hierarchical, whereby clinical viewpoints were valued over non-clinical perspectives. 
participants also reported experiencing and witnessing hostile behavior by other MMRC members when community members stated divergent viewpoints. Community members reported being told that they were the ones, and I quote, causing tension in the room, and they also frequently had to endure microaggressions. Participants also expressed that conversations around maternal death cases could be trauma-inducing, and that case narratives at times contained offensive and inappropriate language. In addition, participants reported there was a lack of respect for the deceased birthing person during conversations and conversations on the committee centered around blaming pregnant and birthing people for their own deaths. Participants also reported carrying the burden of teaching other MMRC members about the role of racism and discrimination in maternal mortality. They described that MMRC members were stuck on blatant racism and, I quote again, don't understand microaggressions and that they're unable to embed and acknowledge the, and name racism as a root cause. This lack of understanding among MMRC members frustrated participants' efforts to identify root causes of health inequities and maternal mortality and to discuss adequate solutions that move beyond the status quo. And finally, respondents discussed the challenges of identifying bias in medical records with fellow committee members and ensuring that the deceased birthing person, not the provider, is centered in those conversations. Again, a variety of opportunities and strategies were presented by the group to address this theme of harmful dynamics in MMRC spaces. Participants reported that many of the challenges they face could be mitigated by ensuring that MMRCs have proportional representation of black and brown people and are led by BIPOC individuals. They expressed that shifting the power towards BIPOC members and chairs who are trained in anti-racist praxis could create more equitable, welcoming and respectful spaces for community members to engage in identifying solutions to address maternal mortality. It could also help shift the focus from interpersonal racism to systemic racism and the impact it has on maternal mortality. And this shift was seen as a way as well to ensure the experiences of the deceased birthing person are centered in case deliberations and subsequent MMRC recommendations. Participants also expressed that MMRCs need to move away from the medical model that requires a burden of proof when evaluating the role of racism and discrimination in maternal death. They purported that using this model leads to an undercounting of the role of racism and discrimination in maternal deaths. They also recommended family member interviews uh, to be included in the process that are conducted by trained social workers uh, to provide a more comprehensive perspective than can be achieved from medical records alone. Uh, they also indicated the inclusion of anti-racist trainings that go beyond implicit bias and that delve into structural racism for members of the committee as it would help them to explore the root causes of health inequities and maternal mortality. And they also expressed the need to improve orientation for community members who are being brought on, informing them of the full responsibilities and expectations, and also provide and secondary trauma that can occur, and providing trauma-informed training and mental wellness to support these MMRC members. And lastly, participants also suggested that MMRC should receive training and guidance on some tools that are out here. Um, MMRC members might be familiar with Texas's discrimination assessment and social determinants of health facilitated discussion tool, which helps to systematically identify and document racism and bias in medical records. Next slide, please. So here is a list of recommendations we generated that is directly informed by the um, participants of this study. And they're grouped into five buckets um, for MMRCs to consider. First is to listen to, center, and collaborate with community members who have the expertise and solutions to address maternal mortality, to diversify membership and meaningfully engage community, to provide training, guidance, and resources to strengthen the capacity of MMRCs, to increase transparency of MMRC processes and data, and the last one, to strengthen the capacity of MMRCs to better examine and address racism and discrimination. Um, and there are sub-bullets under these recommendations which are available in the report. And keep in mind, these recommendations are not meant to be blanket or universal solutions for all state and city MMRCs. Next slide, please. 
And on this slide here are just five buckets of recommendations for the CDC, which funds a majority of MMRCs, and they differ by stipulating that CDC should implement mandates around the recommendations for MMRCs to follow, as well as provide additional funding to MMRCs to increase their capacity to more rapidly review cases and support local community uh, to implement their own solutions, as well as supporting equity experts to train and provide guidance to MMRCs. Next slide, please. So as final notes on this project, I'd like to summarize that participants presented a variety of challenges and potential opportunities for MMRCs to integrate equitable practices through their processes. And again, it's important to note this is not an exhaustive list. Each strategy and solution will not work for every community. And the key to all these strategies is listening to and centering the voices of community members and those most impacted by maternal mortality. And all conversations regarding maternal deaths, policy solutions, and improvements needed to the systems contributing to maternal mortality should start and end with the community. We'd like to thank all of our technical advisors on this project and participants, which included Alliance members and MMRC members for their participation and contributions to this work. I'll now pass it over to Angela to discuss some of BMMA's policy activities. Thank you so much, Felicia. So today we are faced with a serious maternal health crisis in the United States. Some of the systems challenges in maternal health are that policy at the federal level is primarily driven by physician communities, which silos other approaches to advancing maternal health care. Policies that only look at services within the traditional medical context are extremely limiting, while important, um, and does not always address the core problems of health disparities. They often further exacerbate the problem. Currently, there's a lot of interest in health equity, but how health equity can be achieved is not always fully understood. Maternal health is still deeply entrenched in the patriarchal narrative that only cares for the woman's body in relation to being able to have a healthy baby. Interventions to address adverse maternal health outcomes focus heavily on individual behavior change. And there's not a serious investment in community-driven solutions in maternal health care that's led by the communities most impacted. While this is not an exhaustive list of challenges to addressing maternal health disparities from a policy perspective, um, through all of this and including the historical traumas on our bodies and the systems of oppression in our communities, Black women have always led the charge to advocate for ourselves and create avenues for resilience and healing. Next slide. It is also appalling in our current environment to witness and experience in real time the consequences of a lack of investment in the public health and emergency preparedness infrastructure of the US, especially at the local level during the COVID-19 crisis. This has been very traumatizing and deeply um, deadly for all vulnerable populations. Unfortunately, the pandemic is disproportionately affecting Black communities. It has further amplified existing healthcare inequities and has intensified the maternal health crisis in this nation. Next slide. So here at BMMA, we approach maternal health policy through our policy priorities lens, which is to identify and ensure mechanisms for engagement and prioritization of Black women and Black women-led entities and policy and program development and implementation. Establish equitable systems of care to address racism, obstetric violence, neglect and abuse. Expand and protect meaningful access to quality, affordable, and comprehensive health care coverage, which includes the full spectrum of, mater of maternal and reproductive health care services for Black women. Next slide. And so here at BMMA, our current policy priorities are to educate key stakeholders on the impacts of 
pending state Medicaid postpartum eligibility and coverage to 12, mo 12 months following delivery. Advocate for enhanced reimbursement for perinatal health care providers. This includes full spectrum doulas, midwives of all licensing backgrounds, community health workers, lactation consultants, um, the full gamut of par Black perinatal workforce through educational materials and technical assistance. And also to advocate for pregnancy accommodations for pregnant people in the workplace. Next slide. Nearly 50% of births are paid for many uh, for federal uh, Medicaid. And nearly 66% of birth, Black women's births are funded by a uh, public health insurance program. Yet under federal law, women and birthing people lose public health coverage 60 days after giving birth. This is significant because the CDC and medical research shows women can experience maternal mortality um, well past this 60 day mark. Black women are at higher risk of experiencing maternal mortality and morbidity because of other health disparities. So therefore it is imperative for public health insurance programs to extend eligibility during the full postpartum period um, to address the high risk that back, black women experience during this time. Also during the early response of the pandemic, hospitals and medical facilities initiated policies to likely prevent the spread of the virus, but the consequences increases infant separation at birth from the mother and decreased support system in the birth settings. While the impact is still being measured, these practices likely had adverse impacts on birthing people and the vital connections made at birth for the infant and maternal health outcomes. As um, the COVID uh, vaccinations protocols and research began and continue, it is necessary to include Black women and Black pregnant people through these studies. BMMA researchers and advocates continue to push for disaggregated and demographic specific data collection and analysis in research in order to advance policy. Access to quality, holistic, unbiased, and culturally relevant maternity care can be difficult to find in air, any area, but may be particularly, particularly difficult in rural communities. So therefore we advocate for more resources to these communities, especially in black rural communities and uh, black native um, and indigenous uh, communities as well to fund and staff maternal maternity care centers, as well as equitable pay to prenatal and birth professionals, including doulas, midwives and lactation consultants and the full gamut of perinatal um, health workforce. Lack of diversity in maternity care provisions reflects a history rooted in racism and sexism and other forms of oppression and pushing out traditional birth practices. And we see that the lack of traditional midwives and doulas can be informed by a legally uh, biased environment, making it difficult to practice free from prosecution. And now I'll turn it over to Clark Willer who will discuss um, even more specifically some of our recent policy activities as it relates to some of the things that I've presented today. Thank you. Thank you, Angela, and greetings, everyone. Again, my name is Clark Wheeler, she, her, and I'm the federal policy manager here at BMMA. Today, I'll be providing an overview of some of the issues we're working on in the policy department, including pregnancy accommodations in the workplace, and barriers to providing midwifery care, both in Georgia and nationwide. I'll start with the issue of pregnancy accommodations. I'd like to begin with some data points about pregnancy in the workplace. First, three quarters of women will be pregnant and employed at some point in their lives. Most pregnant workers can expect a routine and healthy pregnancy. However, one in five pregnant workers occupies physically demanding jobs that require prolonged standing, continuous and strenuous movements, long hours, inconsistent work schedules, and or heavy lifting. These physical demands can cause issues during pregnancy such as preterm birth, low birth weight, and miscarriage. Moreover, many full-time workers in low-wage jobs are not allowed flexibility, 
with respect to when they take breaks at 40%, their start and quit times between 66 and 75%, and their schedule in general at 50%. Black mothers have the highest labor force participation rates in the country at 76% and occupy a large portion of these demanding jobs. These participation rates are not only high, but also compounded by the fact that Black mothers are already at a higher risk for pregnancy-related complications, such as preeclampsia, preterm birth, and even fatal complications, as you've heard earlier in this presentation. Next slide, please. Healthcare professionals have consistently recommended that some pregnant individuals adjust their work activities to sustain a healthy pregnancy and prevent adverse pregnancy outcomes. These workplace accommodations can include, but are not limited to, allowing additional bathroom breaks, opportunities to stay hydrated, limits on lifting, or access to a chair or stool to decrease time spent standing. However, even with these recommendations and current state pregnancy accommodation laws, many pregnant and postpartum workers face barriers to incorporating them in their work days. Members of the audience may know that the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, which was passed over 40 years ago, set a standard that pregnant workers should receive the same accommodations that would be offered to a similarly situated employee, but it did not provide an affirmative right to accommodations for pregnant workers. Given the uniqueness of pregnancy-related issues, Pregnancy may not easily compare with other employees' needs, nor do pregnant workers always have someone they can point to in their workplace who has received accommodations. They also may not have the same time or resources to find a comparator in their workplace. So in practice, the standard established in the Pregnancy Discrimination Act is too vague for pregnant and postpartum workers to actually use. And as a result, these workers are consistently denied reasonable accommodations for pregnancy, lactation and other postpartum needs. Next slide, please. In response to this issue in 2021, Black Mamas Matter Alliance and the Better Balance, which is a national legal advocacy organization, conducted a listening session with Alliance partners from nine states to discuss the ways they directly support Black pregnant and postpartum workers as they navigate pregnancy accommodations in the workplace. Our participants included representatives from trusted community-based organizations, including Southern Birth Justice Network in Florida, Mothering Justice in Michigan, Baobab Birth Collective in Alabama, Black Women for Wellness in California, the Bloom Collective in Maryland, Restoring Our Own Through Transformation or Root in Ohio, Ancient Song Doula Services in New York, the Afia Center in Texas, and Sister Song in Georgia. The goals for the listening session were one, gaining a better understanding of the challenges that Black pregnant and postpartum workers face when seeking pregnancy accommodations. Number two, centering and amplifying the voices of Black birth workers and organizational leaders. And number three, developing evidence and recommendations for policymakers to take action on this issue. Some of the discussion questions for participants included things like, what kind of accommodations have your clients asked for at work because of their pregnancy? Have you seen examples where birthing people's health or infant's health has been compromised because they couldn't get the accommodations they needed? And how can we make better connections between workplace issues and healthcare outcomes? Next slide, please. I'd like to read a quote from one of our participants um, that really speaks to the issue uh, addressed in the report. One of our doula clients was actually fired from her job at a gas station. Her feet were getting swollen because she was standing on her feet at the gas station. She asked for a stool and they were like, you got to go. She was fired and basically lost out on resources to save up for her child before the child was born. When she became income insecure, her iron levels dropped down really low where she had to start going to the hospital and getting iron infusions just to get her to a safe level to have a birth center birth. The same client, she previously worked at a retail store and she didn't get enough time and a break. So her breast started leaking. Her boss ended up making fun of her instead of realizing that this is a nursing mother. She felt so humiliated that she quit her job. And this was Tiffany Brooks from Southern Birth Justice Network. This was a really powerful narrative and unfortunately others share more narratives like this during the session. Taken together, the listening session revealed that too often Black pregnant and postpartum workers are faced with really the impossible choice between maintaining their health or supporting themselves and their families due to the lack of pregnancy accommodations. Next slide, please. 
In the report, we also wanted to underscore how the history of Black women's reproductive oppression and labor exploitation in the United States continues to shape modern day dynamics for Black pregnant and postpartum workers. As we heard earlier, under the system of chattel slavery, Black women were subjected to difficult and unsafe work throughout their pregnancies and without accommodations, as well as nursing and caring for white children, forced separations from their own children, and sexual and obstetric violence, among other injustices. In the century after slavery, Black women had a significantly higher workforce participation rate than white women, all while they, their families, and communities experienced Jim Crow segregation and racial subjugation. Black women continue to be underpaid, overworked, and pathologized for their sexual and reproductive behaviors today as a legacy of these historical dynamics and events. In response to both the listening session and our political and historical analysis of this issue, we make several policy recommendations in the report. First, we recommend that Congress pass the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act or the PWFA, which provides employees the right to reasonable accommodations for limitations related to pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions, including lactation. We also recommend that Congress pass the PUMP Act and establish a nationwide right to paid family medical leave and paid sick leave. This report in the listening session and informants report puts the research principles discussed earlier in practice including by ethically engaging with and listening to Black birth workers and organizational leaders. It also contributes to a larger bucket of work that our policy department will be building out on pregnancy accommodations, accessibility, and environmental justice for Black women and birthing people. Next slide, please. I'd like to now transition to discuss some of the work we've done on midwifery policies. Very soon, we'll be publishing a report on structural barriers and policy solutions in Black midwifery care from a national perspective. Next slide. So the report starts with a history of Black women's birth work in the United States and explains how it is rooted in pre-colonial African traditions that included not only the practice of catching babies, but also breastfeeding, child rearing, family counseling, and spiritual healing. We know that historically in the United States, the vast majority of births were attended by traditional birth attendants and lay midwives. In the early 20th century, the rise of obstetrics and gynecology, the development of hospital systems, and the push to control infectious diseases by the United States Public Health Service led to increased hospital births. White progressive, with a capital P, progressive reformers led a campaign against Black midwives, blaming them for high maternal and infant mortality rates and characterizing their work as unsanitary and dangerous. This historic campaign against Black midwifery care created the conditions and culture that we still see today in maternity care laws and systems. Currently, many state regulations exclude direct entry midwives or perinatal healthcare providers with competency-based education and training from legally practicing. Inconsistencies in state regulation, education, and accreditation create an unstable environment for potential and practicing midwives. Black midwives make up a small share of the midwifery workforce today as a result. In May and June, 2020, Black Mamas Matter Alliance held a two-part convening on midwifery, midwifery and birth centers. The focus of this convening was to engage Alliance partners in deep strategic conversation on midwifery, or I think maybe the next slide. I think the next slide, yeah. <laughs> On, on midwifery, um, birth centers, and full, full spectrum models of care, as well as policy strategies to advance holistic maternity care and reproductive health care. Could you go to the next slide, please? The objectives of the convening were to understand the current laws and policies regarding midwifery practices for each state, organization, birth sending, educational pathway, and credential, to collaboratively support midwifery legislation and policies which model the reproductive justice framework, addressing Black maternal health and critically important solutions centering Black women and the right to live and thrive. And finally, to discuss and strategize next steps moving forward to support Georgia and other states in their efforts to diversify the perinatal health workforce and birth settings. Based on both our findings from the 2020 Midwifery and Birth Centers convening and our historical and political analysis on this issue, Black Mamas Matter Alliance recommends the following. One, pass the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act. As folks may know, the Momnibus is a legislative package of 12 bills 
that seeks to address every dimension of the maternal health crisis in the United States. As part of the Momnibus, the Perinatal Workforce Act establishes grants to grow and diversify the perinatal workforce and educate providers, managed care entities, and other insurers about the value and process of delivering respectful maternal health care through diverse and multidisciplinary care provider models. Number two, pass the Mama's First Act. The Mama's First Act, which will be reintroduced this week, provides coverage under the Medicaid program for services provided by doulas, midwives, and tribal midwives. This bill defines midwives as those who meet at a minimum the international definition of the midwife and global standards for midwifery education as established by the International Confederation of Midwives. Number three, expand licensure of midwifery. We need to provide legal pathways to licensure for certified midwives, certified professional midwives, and lay midwives, including traditional, grand, and independent midwives. Number four, eliminate additional barriers to providing midwifery care. In addition to expanding licensure, policymakers should expand midwives' scope of practice, expand access to preceptor opportunities, and eliminate burdensome requirements surrounding physician supervision, prescriptive authority, and birth center operation. Number five, leverage health departments. Although state and local health departments have historically created barriers for Black midwives to practice, they can support midwifery care in several key ways. Health departments can fund midwifery credentialing and education, connect birthing people with midwives, birth centers, and home visiting programs, and provide public education on midwifery and the benefits and challenges associated with different birth settings. Number six, honor Black midwives. As a response to the historical and ongoing suppression of Black midwifery care, policymakers should create programs and systems that invest in both archiving and educating the public on Black midwifery models of care, traditions, and histories of resistance. Policymakers should also officially commit to repairing harms to Black midwives by engaging in, in accountability processes led by these communities. Next slide, please. This week, BMMA is also publishing an issue brief on expanding midwifery licensure in Georgia, specifically. As folks may know, Georgia is facing one of the worst maternal health crises in the country. Georgia has the second highest maternal mortality ratio of any state in the US, second only to Louisiana. From 2015 to 2017, there were 68.9 pregnancy-associated deaths and 25.1 pregnancy-related deaths per 100,000 live births in the state. 87% of these pregnancy-related deaths were preventable. Black, non-Hispanic women were 2.3 times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than white, non-Hispanic women. Next slide, please. At the same time, 73% of counties in Georgia have no hospital or birth center offering maternity care, and 36.7% of counties are considered maternity care deserts. And you can see what this looks like in March of Dimes' maternity care desert map on the right. Georgia also has one of the most restrictive state policies in relation to licensing midwives. The state only licenses certified nurse midwives, or CNMs, and gives credentialing authority through the Georgia Board of Nursing, making it illegal to practice midwifery in the state without a nursing credential. Although CNMs can practice legally in Georgia, they too experience numerous challenges, including difficulty finding jobs in rural areas, identifying physician collaborators, and obtaining hospital privileges. In this issue brief, we provide a brief overview of the history of the suppression of midwifery in Georgia, and the ways that unjust racist policies against grand midwives in the state in the early 20th century led to the current dynamic in which the state simultaneously has one of the worst maternal health crises and one of the most restrictive midwifery laws in the country. Next slide. We recommend that Georgia expand midwifery licensure to include certified professional midwives, certified midwives, lay traditional and grand midwives. We also recommend that Georgia establish a state board of community midwifery through which community midwives can inform and shape state policies impacting community midwifery. As of April 2022, these policies are outlined in the Georgia Community Midwife Act. More broadly, BMMA calls on policymakers, institutions, professional associations, accreditation bodies, and other stakeholders to center Black midwives, women, and burden people in policy and program development and implementation which looks like 
building and investing in spaces for Black midwives of all designations to convene and build consensus on policies and programs impacting their practice. It can also look like engaging the experiences and insights of Black women and birthing people, particularly those living in rural communities and maternity care deserts and who have experienced harm due to Georgia's suppression of midwifery. And it can also look like repairing historic and ongoing harms to Black midwives, women, and birthing people by, again, engaging in accountability processes led by these communities. We also recommend that these stakeholders continue to fight the maternal health crisis by working to eliminate other barriers to providing midwifery care, including low reimbursement rates, scope of practice restrictions, burdensome birth center regulations, physician super supervision requirements, and also address other barriers to accessing midwifery care, including public and private insurance coverage, limitations, maternity care deserts, and the social determinants of health inequities. Thank you for your attention, and I'll hand it over to Angela. Thank you so much for that, Clark. Before we go to the Q&A portion, I'd like to highlight the following announcements. Be sure to join us for the rest of our Black Maternal Health Week campaign and support the activities of our Alliance by reviewing the local events tab on our website at blackmamasmatter.org forward slash BMHW. Again, we'd like to thank all of this year's Black Maternal Health Week sponsors. we like to give a special recognition to our change maker level sponsors, Vitamin Angels, Walgreens, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and Pampers. I'll now turn it over to Gianna Wilson, our spectacular senior coordinator, who will be fielding questions from the chat box to our presenters. Good afternoon. Thank you to our panelists for their informative presentations. If you have some questions that you'd like to pose to the panelists, please feel free to post them in the chat. The first question comes to us from Cynthia Simpson. Cynthia's question is, what questions should be asked pertaining to reproductive care? If a doctor isn't taking note of our concerns, what should be our next responsibility? This question is posed to all of the panelists. I believe you guys are still on, on mute. So I'll jump in. I didn't know if anyone else wanted to jump in first, but I would add that finding a healthcare provider who respects your autonomy and decision making as a patient is really important. Um, sometimes that comes in the form of having additional support, for example, birth workers like doulas, um, in addition to another healthcare provider, can help you advocate for yourself, help you create your birth plan, and to make sure that your voice is heard throughout your birthing and a process in pregnancy. And then what was the second part of the question, Gianna? The second what part should is- should happen? Right, what, what questions should, should this person ask to their healthcare provider if they feel that they are not being listened to or that their needs are not being met? So I, I don't know a specific questions if they think their needs aren't being met, but I would say, in instances where, where birthing people feel like their needs are not being met, um, you have the choice to shop around, to find another healthcare provider. And so it's okay, like having the correct uh, and the best fit birthing team is, is critical. It's critical to your experiences during pregnancy, during your postpartum experience. 
So if you find that your provider is not listening to you or does not respect your wishes um, throughout your pregnancy, then I would strongly recommend changing providers, changing providers um, and finding someone who is a better fit. And again, sometimes um, having access to a doula can provide the additional support that you need to better advocate advocate, excuse me, for yourself and also to navigate the healthcare system. Thank you. The next question comes to us from Brianna Lipscomb. I believe that Clark touched on some, some things that this question addresses, but Brianna's question is based on the MMRC report, are there any current asks to Congress or the US Department of Health and Human Services to provide increased funding to support states in putting these recommendations into practice? Is there a call to action for advocates? Take that question, Gianna. Uh, thank you for that, Brianna. So CDC has verbally supported the implementation of the recommendations in our report across MMRCs, and they are providing a platform for the report results to be presented at their yearly meeting of all MMRCs that they fund this May. However, there has not yet been any discussion that we're aware of, of CDC requesting funds from these other um, entities, additional funds to support MMRCs in implementing the recommendations. Um, and to the second portion of your question about a call to action for advocates, we do think that's a great one. Our report was focused on centering the experiences and voices of community members who have um, tried to engage with MMRCs, and that was the first step in the process. Um, we do think, however, that advocates can use the report findings, which are supported by CDC, and the subsequent issue briefs that we'll be releasing on each theme to bolster and support collaborations with MMRCs to um, improve their systems and structures and to find ways to meaningfully include community um, and local advocates within the MMRC processes. Thank you so much for your response. The next question is from Marie Dezine, and please forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your last name. Marie's question is, I come from a Caribbean culture. Is there any education being taught to the doctors on Black women from other cultures? Can any of the panelists speak to um, Marie's question about Black women in other cultures and maternal health? Absolutely. This is Angela. Um, what I will actually highlight and amplify here is that um, our alliance is actually made up of um, Black women-led organizations that serve a variety of populations in their locations at the state and at the local levels, some of which actually also um, venture out and go to different regions, not only um, different regions of the United States, but the Caribbean and on the African continent um, in terms of providing care, sharing resources, um, providing training opportunities, and just overall networking with other global Black birthing people. And so with that, um, I do invite you to check out our website with the listing of our partners. Um, I know that um, our partners up in Syracuse, New York, uh, Village Birth Internationals, um, not only do they provide services to the um, African immigrant and um, Caribbean um, migrant populations there, they also do a lot of work around um, also training um, African immigrant um, and other Black immigrant communities to be birth workers and doula um, providers in their location um, and also um, certify them um, in that uh, particular work. Um, I know that Southern Birth Justice Network also works with a lot of Haitian um, communities um, in the Miami-Dade, Florida area as well. 
Um, they too also do birth justice work, um, also not only in um, Miami-Dade, but then also connect a lot of their work um, in Southeast Africa as well. Uh, they just put on a wonderful webinar the other day around the work that they've done um, in connecting with Black birth workers in Zanzibar, for example. So um, again, our um, alliance um, across the nation, um, and, and again, our partners that are listed on our website, um, really do uh, do a lot of their work to connect across the diaspora and share resources, best practices, and even learn from um, other Black birth workers globally as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for your answers. Thank you to our panelists. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for their participation. Uh, that's all the time that we have for questions. And I'll turn things back over to Milan to close out the webinar. Thank you, Gianna. And thank you, everyone, for being here and sharing space with us this afternoon. Thank you to our wonderful, wonderful panel members. Um, I work closely with many of them, and I'm still in awe of the work that you all do. So thank you very much for being here today. We hope you gained a new understanding of how BMMA operationalizes our work in research and policy and the ways in which we are embodying our Black Maternal Health Week campaign theme, which is building for liberation through centering Black mamas, Black families, and Black systems of care. Thank you for attending this webinar. You can also access the reports and publications that we discussed here today on our website at www.blackmamasmatter.org slash resources. You can continue to engage with us throughout the Black Maternal Health Week campaign by following us on all of our social media platforms, which you will see here on the screen and through the hashtag BMHW22. Visit our website for additional information about BMMA, sign up for our newsletter to be involved in our initiatives. And again, with sincere gratitude for your attendance for today's webinar, we thank you. Please have a good one and stay safe, everyone.